did it. I did it. All right. Here's what we're doing. Momentum. This is what this chapter is all about. It's on momentum. It's on collisions. Okay. That's the focus here. Um, what Now, what you learned last lecture, well, not last lecture, but the, the last few lectures is we learned the concept of conservation of energy. That's the first time that you saw a conservation law. Conservation laws are very important things in physics. Um, they are very valuable tools to solve problems. Well, we have a, another conservation law, and it's called the conservation momentum. The conservation momentum is focused mostly on collisions. When I say collisions, we don't just mean things colliding like that. We also mean explosions as well. That's the opposite of a collision, and we can solve those problems too. And there's a lot of reasons why we're doing this. Uh, one of the reasons is because it's a tool. We have a lot of tools in physics. We have forces. We analyze problems with forces and kinematics. We have a concept of energy. Now we have another tool, and that's momentum. Okay. Another reason we're getting into this is because momentum looks at forces in greater detail. Okay, one thing that you don't see in forces and what you also don't see in energy is concepts of time. So when we talk about forces being applied, we don't really know exactly how they're applied. We don't know, um, you know, why, uh, <clears throat> well, we don't know how the forces are applied. Okay, and so because of that, um, we have a, a more simplistic understanding of forces when we did the force stuff. Now, momentum allows us to look at how a force is applied over time, and that gives us a much more detailed understanding of how forces work. In fact, actually, when Newton first created his laws of motion, um, he didn't say F equals MA. That was not his formulation. His formulation was that force is a rate of change momentum. And so the original interpretation of, of how forces work actually involved this concept of momentum, which we do realize is related to you know, acceleration. So let's just get right into it then. So we have this concept called momentum. So um, now the word momentum right, in modern you know, vernacular is, uh, has a connotation to it, right? When you think of momentum, you think about a sports team, right? You know, sports team, you know, is winning a lot of games in a row, they have momentum, right? That's obviously a very different thing. So uh, you should not try to interpret the word momentum as any physical thing. It's just the name of an equation, really. That's just, that's what you should do. Don't, don't consider the idea of what momentum might mean for something. Momentum is simply the product of mass times velocity. That's it. Don't, don't, don't make it more complicated than that. Anyway, so we have a symbol for that. The symbol is P, okay, and it is a vector quantity. It's defined as the product of uh, mass and velocity. So um, <clears throat> being that it's a vector, uh, the definition is basically a scalar multiple of velocity. So velocity and momentum vector are parallel to each other. They go in the same direction. Um, Mass is what modifies things. Mass is a scalar, though. So all the things we've done with vectors, we can do with momentum. So um, that's different than energy. Energy was not momentum. Uh, sorry, energy was not vector quantities. They were scalars. But these are vectors. So there are components to be concerned about. When we analyze a particular behavior, we need to break things into components, x and y components, to do that. Mm -hmm. Right, so I got a question right off the bat for you here. Uh, the carts change in momentum, okay? So the delta P here is initial, sorry, final momentum minus initial momentum, okay? So I would like you to think about the scenario here. The above picture is the before, the bottom picture is the afterwards, okay? So again, we're talking about final momentum minus initial momentum, okay? So think about this for a minute. Go ahead and type a letter into the chat as to what you think the answer is going to be here.
10. Oh. <laughs> Okay, a lot of people saying D, got a C mixed in there, got a B mixed in there. The answer is D. So a lot of you said D, that's good. <clears throat> the final momentum is 10 kilograms times one. So that's the units. There's no special units for momentum, by the way. Kilograms, meters over seconds. Uh, the initial momentum would be 10 times a negative 2. Now, again, these are the purpose of this question is to communicate to you these are vector quantities. If momentum is negative, that simply means that the particle is traveling in the direction that we've called negative, which we typically say left is negative, so that's what it is. So it's a negative... So 10 minus a minus 20. So the change is 30. Okay, the change is 30 here. All right. So again, vector quantity, the initial momentum is negative, the bottom one's positive, you're effectively adding here. Okay, great. All right. <clears throat> so this is sort of what I mentioned before about looking at collisions in a greater amount of detail now. So this example with the tennis racket and the tennis ball is great. Because when you hit the tennis ball, the force that's applied is not an instantaneous thing. All forces are applied over a period of time. And they're not applied equally. Okay, so in this example here, what we're looking at is, is a type of spring force. So when the ball initially comes in contact with the tennis racket, there's going to be a very small force. In fact, do I have a picture here of that? Yeah, okay, I do, I do. I have pictures later. I'll, I'll explain this later. So when the force is being applied, initially the force is kind of small because the ball and the racket are not compressed too much, but that starts to apply a force. That force means there's an acceleration. Okay, the velocity vector initially points to the right. The acceleration vector points to the left, and that makes the ball slow down. As the ball becomes more and more compressed and the racket becomes more compressed, we see the force increase and it reaches a peak. At that peak, that's when the acceleration is at its maximum and that's when the ball actually starts to change direction. Then the force starts to weaken as the ball rebounds off of the racket. Okay, so that's what we're looking at in this example here. We have this collision that takes place. We got a Newton's third law interaction. We're gonna see a lot of Newton's third law interactions here because we're talking about collisions. Collisions are all about interactions. And so while that's being applied here, there's an acceleration that's to the left. As this thing gets compressed, the more it's compressed, the greater the force is, and then it rebounds off. So if you could see a graph that illustrates force and time, it will sort of look like the graph that you see down here. Okay. So this is a more detailed picture of how the collision's actually taking place. It's not always a bell-shaped curve like this. I mean, for something that has a symmetrical interaction, like a ball hitting a tennis racket, you do have this, okay? Now, when we look at forces in more detail like this, when we start to care about the amount of time that the force occurs, we have a, a name for that, and we call it an impulse, or we say that the force is an impulsive force. And what the impulsive force simply means is now we really care about the length of time that this took place with, okay? So there's an initial velocity as it comes in, okay? The force is applied over this delta T here, okay? Which means you have an acceleration that is changing, okay? At the top of the curve here, you have the greatest amount of force, the greatest amount of acceleration, and it turns out that at that peak is when the particle will stop and change direction. And then and in most circumstances, when you rebound off, you have the exact same behavior on the other side. So we can characterize an initial and a final speed. We look at how the momentum changes as a result of the force, and we can work out some details about how the interaction took place. That's the idea, okay? So this is a great slide. This is a fun slide. All right, so at the top is our traditional F equals MA. You know that, that's Newton's second law. That's what you learned back in the force chapter. Well, 
What is acceleration? Acceleration is actually a rate of change of velocity. So you can change the acceleration to a dv dt. Well, m is a constant. It's a scalar. We can sneak that into the derivative there. Now we have mv into the derivative, and that's what momentum is. And this f equals dp dt, that's what I mentioned. That was Newton's first uh, notion of force. Uh, forces change the momentum of an object. Okay. So what we do with this is, this is in differential form. Well, we can change this into integral form. Okay, so don't tell any mathematician what I'm gonna do here. They'll be very mad at me. We're gonna multiply both sides of the equation by dt. Shh, don't tell anybody I did that, but you can do that. We're physicists, we can do that. And the dt comes on the other side, and then we integrate both sides of the equation. Now, if you integrate dp just by itself, that's just the difference between the two momentums. So that's what the left side becomes. It becomes just the change in the momentum, and the right side becomes a time integral of the force, okay? And this time integral of the force, that's, we have a name for that, and that's what we call the impulse. And we have a symbol for that, and that symbol is J, okay? I don't know why it's J, it's just it's J, all right? And the, the units of that would be in Newton seconds. That sounds a lot like Newton meters, right? That's, that's what work and energy is, but this is Newton seconds. And... Um, and so if we can characterize how the force is applied over time, that allows us to calculate the impulse, and the impulse is related to the change in the momentum. Okay, now, I realize that, you know, a lot of you still in 150. Yeah, maybe you haven't even reached integration yet. We have uh, approached the topic of integration before when we looked at, like, acceleration and velocity graphs, we wanted to work backwards. Right, and if you remember what we said there, if you do the integral of the velocity curve, you get a displacement. But the way we did that is you didn't actually calculate any integrations, you just did areas. So going back here, the area bounded by this graph here, whatever that area is, if you have the means to work out what that area is, and we will always be able to do that. We'll have nice simple shapes, not bell curves. We'll have rectangles, maybe even like a triangle or something, but we're gonna make it simple enough that you can easily calculate what the area is. That area is the value of the integral. So I'm not, at this point in the class, I'm not actually gonna have you evaluate any integrals other than just look at a graph, calculate an area, okay? Don't worry, next chapter, we're gonna do integrals, okay? And they're gonna be fun, I don't know, I like them. All right, <clears throat> now, picture in the upper right is the realistic description of how the force is applied, okay? So what you have here, okay, is you have the particle starts with a momentum, the force is applied to it, the force increases over time, it reaches a peak, we call it F max, right? That peak in the force, that's very important for a lot of reasons. That, that actually tells us you actually use that to judge the structural stability of things. You know, so for example, um, well, I'm not going to get to that yet. Anyway, so anyway, that I'll, I'll talk more about that F max later. But anyway, so here's the thing. There's an area here, right? Now, this is actually a, a theorem in, in mathematics. I forgot, maybe it's the mean value theorem or something. I can't remember exactly what the theorem is. But what you can do is, while this may be the realistic picture, you can create an equivalent picture. You could have the exact same area here, but described with a simpler shape. So what we do is we say, well, let's not consider that we have an F max. Let's not consider the fact that our force varies over time. We can come up with an equivalent area. Okay, this is the physics. We're flattening the curve here, but there's no viruses here. We just got, we just got uh, forces here. So we're gonna flatten our curve, and there's actually something to that here, but. By flattening the curve, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, what if we just consider that there's an average force applied over a certain duration? And that has the exact same area. And that's actually how we're going to try to treat a lot of our problems. We don't really want to know the more complex situation. We actually want to know the simpler idea. Okay. Now, the whole idea of, I mentioned this flatten the curve, that's a thing. That, you know, that's like, okay, baseball, right? Catcher, mitt, right? Why do they have a mitt? Well, one of the reasons why they have a mitt is because they didn't have a mitt. Catching a ball that goes, you know, 90 miles an hour with your hand is going to break your bones. Why? Because 
your, your curve is going to look like this, except it's going to shoot up like crazy. I mean, the amount of time, right? It's going to look something like this. It's gonna, oh, I don't want that. Get rid of that. How about we do a free hand? Yeah. So if you have like a, a catcher catching a ball, I mean, you're, you're talking about something like this. Comes up, and it's this hugely sharp peak with an enormous F max up here. Now, the problem with F max is when you reach that, is that force enough to break a bone? I mean, every, you know, your, the bones in your hand have a structural stability. There's a limit at which how much force they can take, right? So, you know, with the catcher's mitt, what you're doing is you're basically taking this curve and you're turning it into what it is down here. Now, you don't have a, you're not exactly a leveling things off like this, but with the catcher's mitt, instead of having this small interval of time right here when the ball comes in contact, you actually have a curve that probably looks like this now kind of comes up and does this. And so that might have the exact same area, but what you're doing is you've increased the duration. When you increase the duration, then you lessen the max force. So you're cushioning the blow. Same thing applies to, you know, if you, you know, you got a giant, you know, pool of marshmallows, right? That'd be fun to jump into as opposed to uh, an empty pool or something. I don't know, that doesn't matter to me sense but um but anyway the point is that when you increase the duration you fly in this curve here and your f max is much lower the catcher's mitt's a great example of that anyway and and i'm trying to end my rant here but the point is that we're very interested in f average and we're going to spend a lot of time trying to simplify our problems to get this okay fantastic Okay, so we have a theorem, okay? It's called the impulse momentum theorem. The change in momentum is equal to the impulse. The left side of the equation, okay? Write this up. The left side of the equation here is final momentum minus initial momentum, okay? Furthermore, that's M. Oh, whoops. Oh no, what did I do? Select. Okay, so the left side looks like M V final minus V initial. Remember, these are vector quantities, right? The right side is going to be the impulse. Now, that can be this average force times your delta T. Or it's the area under the curve. I mean, maybe you have both. Who knows? So when we're solving our problems here, one of the ways you can use the impulse momentum theorem is to say, okay, say you have a graph and say you're given an initial condition, you know, you have a ball coming in at 10 meters per second and it undergoes an interaction and we, and we have a graph of that force over time, the force over time graph. Well, what you can do is you can work out what the area is and we use the impulse momentum theorem to figure out what the final velocity is going to be. That's one of the main ways that this is used. Okay. So down here, same deal. Anyway, this is supposed to be area, something like that, okay? And the same thing applies down here. So I'm gonna do a lot of examples of this. Now, by the way, this might look familiar to you, okay? There is a uh, analogy here, okay? You've seen something like this before. What you saw was um, change in kinetic energy, right? Can I spell? In kinetic, okay. change of kinetic energy was equal to work. And that we call that the work kinetic energy theorem. Well, we have an impulse momentum theorem, and there's a lot of similarities between them. A lot of similarities. Okay. Work was in, well, that entire concept of work kinetic energy was interested in forces and distances. Okay. We have the impulse momentum theorem, which is interested in forces and time. So there's a, a lot of similarities here, too. So it's nice to see that. Uh, that symmetry in what we're doing here. All right, so here's a great example of applying this. We got a ball coming in with a velocity that is positive. It's to the right. It impacts the wall. And for whatever reason, we know what that force is. And so we have the force down here. Now notice that is a negative area because the force does point to the left. So it is negative. Uh, the ball impacts the wall, it rebounds off with some final speed, which would be negative again, vector quantities to the left. 
And so what we see down here is we see the graphical interpretation of what's going on here. We see that we have an initial momentum at the top here. During the collision, the object experiences an acceleration. So we see the, the velocity starting to change. At the maximum compression, it reaches zero. And then it changes direction and starts to go the other way. Now, what they're showing here, and this is not necessarily true, they're show, I mean, this kind of looks like the initial and the final momentums are the same. That's not necessarily true. I mean, that's just, that's just the way this graph is being shown. It doesn't have to be that way. I mean, you're not going to get a faster speed coming off. You're probably going to get a little bit of a slower speed coming off. But if there's no dissipative forces, then you actually you would. The incoming and the outcoming would actually be the same. Okay. And so this jump here from the initial down to the final, that is the change of the momentum. And so, you know, like I said, if we are given the force profile here, if we're given the initial uh, momentum, we could figure out the stuff at the end. And that's how we normally do a lot of this stuff. Oh, look at that. I already said all this stuff. Well, I'm glad that my notes and my brain are in sync, sort of. So I'm not going to say much more about this because I already did. All right. Let's do it. Uh, we have a two kilogram object moving to the right with a speed of five meters, uh, sorry, a half meter per second. That means we know the initial momentum. We know the force. Okay, you can see the graph right there. So we want to use the impulse momentum theorem to figure out what the final speed is going to be. So you may want to spend a little bit of time thinking about this. If you can write something down, you may want to work out a little calculation here. So I'll, I'll wait a little bit, but go ahead and put a letter in the chat if you could. So you can see what it is. All right, the answer here is C. All right, so impulse momentum theorem is what you see right here, delta P equals J. Remember that delta P is final minus initial. I move the initial momentum over to the other side. We have the initial momentum here. Okay, we have the initial momentum. It is text. Okay, so um, let me just write out the steps here, right? So this is we are mass times final velocity, right? That's equal to mass times the initial velocity. And we have our graph here, so the impulse is simply the area. That's a high spill area, that's high spill area, okay. So we have the mass, it's two. Make sure it's in kilograms, V final. Right? We have the mass, and our initial speed is half. That's not a, okay. And what's the area? Well, the area is apparently the force, it's a rectangle, right? So it's two, that's the height. And by the way, that's two newtons. Okay, so you see two newtons uh, times half second. So that's our newton seconds. That's, by the way, also units of momentum. Well, two, final velocity. We got one plus one. All right. So if you uh, solve this for the final velocity, we get one meter per second, and it's positive, so it's to the right. So apparently this force of two newtons that was applied for a half a second, uh, oh, sped the object up apparently. So yeah, this object is already moving to the right at half a meter per second, and it got hit by something that helped it accelerate a little bit. So for that half second, it accelerated from half meter per second to one meter per second. Okay, so that's how that's utilized. Okay. Anyway, I have a million more examples, so you'll see that. Ooh. Oh, I wish I'd left my annotations up. Oh, shoot. Well, I, you guys were all got that right. I messed up. I messed up. Anyway, uh, why? Well, if you remember the annotations from before, uh, you have the same thing. You have your two times the final velocity. Uh, you have your one, but now you have a minus one because the area is negative now, right? The area is negative. The initial momentum was one. This area is negative. So what happened was we have an object, we have a force that stopped the object. And if actually the force was greater, 
or it was applied for a longer period of time, there would be a greater amount of area, and that actually would have caused the object to turn around and travel the other direction. All right, great. Good. Fantastic. All right, read over this. Okay, what we got? We got sun that's light, sun that's heavy. That means the masses are different. Okay, same force for one second. All right, we're trying to figure out what the momentum is of these two things here. So think about that for a minute. Put a letter up when you get a chance. The answer is B. Oh, soup. It's B. Why? Okay, what is the impulse momentum theorem? Change in momentum equals force times time. The force is the same. The time is the same. They experience the same change in momentum. There's something different, right? What's the difference? One is moving faster than the other one. But their momentum is the same. Okay? Because the one that has a lighter amount of uh, mass will have to be traveling faster to have the same product, mass times velocity. All right. Now, this should, hopefully, this will ring a bell in your head. Okay? This will ring a bell. What time is it? What time is it? Ah, oh, I'm going to miss, I'm going to miss my turnip sales before noon. All right, I'm okay. I won't freak out. I just said bells and I immediately thought of turnips. Okay, so for part, uh, so what's different? Okay, so what, okay, focus here. What's, <laughs> What should this remind you of is uh, Newton's third law. If you remember the examples we talked about before, right? Mosquito and a truck hit, right? Same force. That's exactly what this is. It's this change of momentum, right? That's the new version of Newton's second law that we learned. Force equals change of momentum. So when the mosquito and the truck hit, same force. There's a difference. The difference is the acceleration is different because the masses are different. It's the same thing here. In fact, this is really just a, a different side of the exact same problem. Momentum's the same, force is the same. The difference is because of mass differences is a velocity difference. That's cool stuff. That's cool stuff. All right. Let's do an example. I'm going to jump to my stuff here. Okay, here we go. All right. Here is the first example. Real straightforward, real nice. It's basically the same thing we did in the question. Uh, we have a two kilogram object is moving to the right with a speed of one meter per second when it experiences the force shown. What are the object's speed and direction after the force ends? Okay, we start with the impulse momentum theorem, delta P equals J. Delta P is final minus initial momentum. The impulse is the force times the time. Like I said, we're always gonna deal with nice force profiles right now. So we have rectangles. Two newtons over one second, that means the impulse is a positive two. Okay, so you see down here, Impulse is positive two, okay? My initial momentum is mass times velocity, positive one. We add that up, we see that our final momentum is four Newton seconds, okay? Final momentum is mass times the velocity, so we simply divide by the mass and we get two meters per second to the right. Okay, so all we're doing is just taking this equation, write out explicitly what each part is. <clears throat> All right, so what we have here is very similar problem, all right, except instead of me giving you the velocities, um, we're, it's in graphical form here. So uh, a quarter of a kilogram ball hits a wall. This force profile that's shown. We have a velocity profile. We're moving to the left at 10 meters per second, and we hit the wall, and according to the graph, there's enough uh, impulse to slow us down, bring us to a halt, and then travel in the opposite direction. We're gonna be traveling to the right now. Okay, so we do the same thing. Initial, uh, final minus initial, F delta T. Uh, we're looking for the rebound velocity of the ball, so we're looking for the final momentum, then we'll divide by the mass. So the initial momentum is gonna be the half kilogram. You gotta put in kilograms. Right? Make sure you don't put this in grams. You got a negative 10 in here, because you are moving to the left. It's vector quantity. Of is positive here, it's 500, right? Again, this is just the area of a rectangle, okay? So it's the, it's the average force over the interval of time. Now, this is milliseconds, 0 0.008 seconds. So the actual momentum, uh, sorry, impulse here is just 1.5 Newton seconds. 
All right, so, all right, this is this. This is this, sorry. Yeah, I thought this was this. I'm, I'm got to review my own notes here, thank you. All right, anyway, so uh, yeah, you can see here that the net result in the momentum change is positive. So that means our velocity is to the right. 125 bells, that's no good. I'll, I can wait. That's no good. All right, thank you. All right. Um, yeah, so we end up with about 1.5 newton seconds here. That's the uh, momentum, but we have to divide that by the mass. So dividing that by the uh, quarter kilogram gives us our six meters per second. Okay. All right, very good. Good example. All right, we got two kilogram stationary cue balls struck by cue sticks. The cues exert force is shown which ball is going to have the greater final speed. Okay. So the initial momentum of these balls are zero, right? They're, they're at rest. You want to consider the momentum transfer here, and we want to figure out what the final speed is going to be. So think about D is good. All right, great. Now, this is going back to the stuff I talked about, you know, with the catcher's mitt. This is the great illustration. I mean, the, uh, the same effect is happening here. Okay, in both situations, the cue ball is going to be moving at the same speed. But there is a difference, right? The difference is the one on the left has a much greater max force. Now, if your object can sustain that max force, everything's fine. Everything's great. The problem becomes if you exceed the structural stability, okay, what we call that like a tensile strength, of your material when you have a problem. I mean, this is, you know, your future engineers here, this is a consideration you you, you make. You look at, you know, you look at the material science of, of, uh, of, of, you know, of what you're building and you consider impacts. And if you find impacts are too great, you have to figure out ways to lessen that impulse. If a cue ball can withstand 100 Newtons, even though it's for two milliseconds and great, um, but, you know, you could have a thousand newtons in a tenth of a millisecond, and at some point you're going to destroy the ball. So, anyway. Okay, so, you wake in the middle of the night to find that your living room is on fire. That happened to me once. It wasn't my living room, it was my brother's room. I woke up, his room was on fire, slept in a hotel for the next three months, not fun. Anyway, your one chance to save yourself is to throw something that hit the back of your door, bedroom, and close it. Well, this is this is fun. Okay, so you have a sticky ball of clay, and you have a super bouncy, super happy fun ball. Super happy fun ball. Next to your bed, both the same size and the same mass. You have only time to throw one. Okay, so physics will save your life here. Not really, but think about this for a minute here. This is a pretty good example, actually. Think about what you want to throw. What do you want to throw? It's equal A and B here. You want to do A. You want to do the Super Bowl. Why? Okay, so what you're trying to do is you're trying to impart as much force as possible, right? That's the idea. So delta P equals force times time, right? Well, here's what you do. You throw the Super Bowl. Your incoming momentum is MV, right? And then it hits the door, rebounds off. So you have a initial and a final momentum. In fact, let's just assume, okay, that it rebounds off with the same speed. Let's just assume that, right? So if it's your Super Bowl that we're talking about here, what you have is you have your final velocity minus your, uh, you know, Final momentum minus your initial momentum. But if they're the same momentum, sorry, same speed, then the rebound speed is going to be, uh, you know, we just call it V. Let's just call it V, right? So it's MV minus a minus MV, okay? Because you're rebounding off, so now you've switched directions. And so what is this equal to? Well, this equals 2MV. Now, if you got the clay, what will happen? Well, the clay will stick. That's a problem with that because you have your final momentum and you have your initial momentum. Well, OK, 
okay? You're, you're, you don't have initial momentum. So that means your change of momentum here is just MV. So using the super ball, um, you're effectively applying double the amount of force. In fact, you pro it's actually probably better than that, honestly, because you got to imagine the super ball is going to be in contact with the door for a shorter amount of time. So you actually have a greater change of momentum there. So you potentially have, you know, it's even better with the super ball, not only because it rebounds off, but because it doesn't, it's not in contact with the door as much. So that's, that's the logic behind this thing. When, when something sticks to the wall, there is, I mean, if you think about it in terms of energy, there's a, a significant amount of energy that is used to deform the ball, right? And there's force that's being used to crush that clay. And that's force that could have been used to do something else more productive. So I hope this makes sense, but uh, this is a good analogy. Well, it's a good representation of, of how uh, the interaction can lead to greater forces, okay? Rebounding off is always better, okay? So, so I'm not a Super Bowl salesman, but that would be my pitch if I was. But then again, I wouldn't want there to be a fire in your house, so maybe. But if there is, you know, be ready. <clears throat> All right. So, um, Momentum, similar to energy, we characterize a system. And so there's a similar idea here um, when we consider like systems and environments. Uh, when we solve our momentum problems, we consider what's in the system, what's outside the system. Everything that's in the system, we can keep track of its momentum. So we can talk about a system momentum and we add up all of the momentums of the things in our system. And um, the good thing about this though, is that we will never really consider the environment. You know, when we did energy, we did consider environmental factors. We, we said it could be friction. There could be an external work that's done. We don't do that in momentum. I mean, you could, it's just a more complicated problem. Um, and then we wanna think about, okay, well, what happens when we change things here, right? Well, this crazy looking expression down here is how the change in the momentum is going to occur. So this first term here that looks a little wild is basically a mathematical way to characterize the interactions that take place between all the particles in the system. So that's everybody interacting with each other. The second term here is all the external factors. Well, like I said, this second term here, zero. We're not gonna consider external factors at work here. We're only gonna consider the interactions within the system. But guess what? Newton's third law says that every time there's an interaction, these two forces, okay, these two forces are the same. One's just negative. So that means this entire term here is actually zero. So if you have a completely isolated system, your change in momentum over time is zero. Now, if you do have external forces, well, then it's equal to F net, and that's Newton's second law. But if you don't have any external forces, then dp dt is zero. That means your momentum over time in the system doesn't change. And what that means is we have a conservation law. dp dt equals zero, conservation, okay? This has happened in energy, okay? We had delta E system or delta E mechanical. If that was equal to zero, we have an isolated system and we have a conservation law. We've got a new conservation law, okay? And so we're, we are, we're going to use this to solve our problems now. We're going to look at, okay, what's the momentum of all the objects in our system at one instant in time? And then we look at another instant in time, what's going on, and we solve a, a conservation problem there. Okay, so that's good. Well, that's what I'm talking about right here. So again, if the rate of change of momentum is zero, okay, that means the system momentum is a constant number. And so down here is the conservation law. We can characterize the initial aspects of the system and the final aspects of the system, and we can solve some unknown quantity. That's the idea. All right, so let's do a real simple example. Uh, we have a, a train car. Uh, one's at rest, and one moves to the right with a speed, let's call it V initial. Okay. Um, what will happen is uh, the train car will 
hit the back of the second one, and then they move together as a system. So this is um, isolated in the X direction, okay? So there's no external forces here. There's nothing in the environment that's affecting what's going on here. There may be some Y stuff, but when we do conservation, you can separate X and Y out, just like we did with like kinematics. So if we do that here, um, this is our conservation law at the bottom here. What's going on initially? Well, the first cart moves with a speed V sub I, right, the initial. The second cart does not move at all, so that's zero, okay? What happens is they collide and they move together as a system. So that means the final velocities for both objects are exactly the same. So on the left-hand side, we have just two MVs. So we got, ultimately, we have this relationship right here. Right here. And we solve for our final speed, and we see that it's exactly a half. So um, one of the things that you'll realize here is that the nature of this conservation, there's a lot of proportionality here, okay? When these things hit, you effectively doubled the mass. If you double the mass, then it makes sense that the objects move at half their speed. That's what's going on here. Okay. Fantastic. Oh, man. Okay. Mosquito on a truck have a head-on collision, which has a larger change of momentum. C is great. Okay, I mean, it, I guess I've mentioned this before. It's 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 a it's a it's a different perspective of Newton's third law. It's what it is. It's just it's just Newton's third law from a different perspective. So what's happening here is you know this is an isolated system. Uh, you know they're they're going to have the same change of momentum. Okay, now there's differences, right? If you look at what momentum is, there's differences in mass and differences in speed. So there'd be differences there, but the momentum uh, aspect is the same. Okay. All right, so as I mentioned, we typically deal with isolated systems, okay? Isolated systems has no external force. So in that case, the change in momentum is zero, and therefore we can say initial and final. The key with the initial and final though is this, just like in energy, you are dealing with snapshots in time. And it's not just an initial and a final. You may have multiple events that take place. Say, for example, in the, in the example of the train cars, say we hit that train car. But then say later on we hit another train car. We hit a third train car. Well, you can characterize system momentum before, after, and in between. And you actually can come up with an expression for momentum at all at before and after and all intermediate points. And sometimes you'll need to do that to, to work out um, you know, what's missing here. Now, another thing about this isolated system business up here is this. The external force is zero. Okay. Now, gravity is an external force. And so what you might be happy about is that um, we don't really deal with gravity at all. Because if you did, if you included gravity, you'd have to include the momentum of the Earth, which you can do, but I, it, we, we, that's not an isolated system. If you want to make an isolated system with gravity, you got to stick them onto the Earth, and you have a good luck trying to figure that out. So, so almost everything is X direction. We really don't deal with anything in the Y direction unless you're specifically told that gravity does not influence at all what happens here. And we have problems that there's Y stuff. For example, a, a, an explosion. You have an explosion uh, and a piece is ejected into the air and a piece is shot down. Um, you know, if we just look at the initial interaction and we don't think about what happens afterwards and things are accelerating due to gravity, if you just consider that interaction there, um, then, um, oh, I got a Bed Bath & Beyond coupon, awesome. All right, yeah, so, um, but gravity will not be an issue here. Oh, well, guess what? I just said that. Again, I'm so glad that my mind from years ago and today are all in sync. Okay, well, I already said this. I already said this. How much we got left here? I think we're almost done. Oh, yeah. Two more examples. Sweet. All right. Well, let's look at the last two examples here. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, this is being recorded. So, I will process this video right afterwards, edit some stuff out, 
like me sitting there fumbling over technology for a whole minute, I'll take that out probably, or maybe not, I don't know. Um, and then I'll, I'll make sure this is posted to the web page uh, later today. All right, let's do the last two examples here. We have a 1,000 kilogram railroad car rolling at two meters per second when it, uh, a, 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 a 400, uh, sorry, a, a 4,000 uh, kilogram load of gravel suddenly dropped in. What is the car's speed just after the gravel is loaded? Okay, so um, we're using conservation of energy, uh, sorry, of momentum to do these problems here. Uh, we cannot use conservation of energy because, um, well, the system is not completely isolated in all directions. The nice thing about momentum is we only need to consider one direction. We don't have to consider the y direction at all here. We do not need to consider it. In fact, in the y direction, this system is not isolated, but it's okay because you can deal with one direction at a time. So our system is gonna be car and gravel. So the conservation says that the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. And we're only dealing with the x direction stuff here, okay? So what I do is this, I say, okay, system is car and gravel. And then what I do is I create an expression that characterizes the initial momentum of the system for every aspect, for everything in the system. So there's two terms, one for the car and one for the gravel, right? And so I have MC, MC, uh, M, uh, sorry, MC and C uh, initial, you know, okay, mass times velocity initially for the, for the car. Um, now we have it for the gravel as well. Now, yeah, the gravel was dropped. So it had, it had y velocity, but did not have x velocity. So that means this second term here is zero. There is no x direction velocity uh, for the gravel. So this whole term is zero. So that means our initial momentum of the system is just mc uh, and uh, the initial momentum of the car. What about final? Well, the gravel is dumped into the car. So we simply add up the mass of those two and uh, and that represents our, our system now. Okay, we just combine the two together times the final velocity, and we solve for the final velocity here, and, and we get, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a proportion. If we were going, you know, it's 1.4 meters per second, but look, we're going two meters per second with 10,000 kilograms, right? We add in an extra 40%, and guess what? We've gone down 40%. That makes sense. Is that 40%? Yeah, it is, I think. Anyway, but anyway, it's, it's, there's a proportionality here that you can you can utilize, and, and this this it makes conceptual sense here. Okay, now we're going slower. Why? Well, guess what? I mean, if you want to look at the details here, you drop the, you drop the gravel in, its speed is zero, so there needs to be a force. It's a static frictional force that actually cause yeah static frictional force that causes the gravel to accelerate up to 1.4 meters per second, but that makes the car slow down. Okay, so that's, you know, you, you can say, well, why are we going slower? Well, ultimately, it's because we had to speed up, you know, uh, the gravel, but that caused the car to slow down. Last example. Okay, we have a 5,000 kilogram uh, train car is rolling on frictionless rails at 22 meters per second. Rain starts to pour. A few minutes later, the car slows down. So it's very similar to the last example, except now we have a missing mass where we know the speed. You're gonna solve the problem the exact same way, except you're just solving for a different quantity here. Now notice that we did drop in speed, right? By how much? About 10%, right? 22 to 20, it's about 10% the speed. So we shouldn't be surprised if we end up with about 10% more mass than we did. Well, let's just see. What's, yeah, so the system is the car in the rain, only in the x direction we're considering. We characterize the system momentum to begin with. We have the car's momentum. The rain's momentum, there is no momentum for the rain in the x direction, assuming that it just goes straight down. S same thing for the final momentum. We combine the mass of the car and the rain together. We have some final velocity. Conservation says that initial and final are the same. So we create that equation. We solve for the mass of the rain. Okay, so that means you're going to have to take this equation, you're going to have to distribute the final velocity, you move this mcv final term to the other side, you divide, okay, algebra, right? Uh, you work out the details, and ooh, look at this, 500 kilograms, 10% more mass, made us go 10% slower. That's lovely. That That's cool because that conceptually makes sense, and mathematically it works out too, so. Anyway, so those are really basic problems, obviously. Uh, simple. 
You'll like the homework. It's simple. It's nice and simple. What we're going to do in the next lecture is uh, we're going to look at slightly more complicated interactions. And we're also going to consider, um, oh, other types of collisions like explosions. Not just things bumping into each other, but we can actually characterize explosions. And, and then we'll start to look at uh, two-dimensional motion too. Uh, so everything was one dimensional, but you could you actually can incorporate, uh, you know, your vector quantities and you can work out, you know, X and Y stuff. So we're going to do that, too, as well. All right. So anyway, that's I'm done for today.